John James Audubon, America's great pioneer naturalist, painted magnificent illustrations of nearly all the birds of the continent known at the time, and wrote an ornithological biography which animates and enriches the record of his vision. Audubon traveled extensively, exploring the primeval forests of Pennsylvania, trekking the swamps of the Carolinas, and coursing the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. In 1831, Audubon resolved to study and record the extraordinary and splendid bird life of Florida. The southern tip of Florida is the setting of the most remarkable array of bird characters to be seen in North America. Here, where the Everglades creep across a broad front into the sun-bathed Gulf of Mexico, a wilderness flourishes which generates an unequaled profusion of habitat and food. Birds here have developed a marvelous variety of adaptations and behavior to take advantage of this abundance. Audubon observed the exploitation of these birds, which was to bring many of them to the edge of extinction. His presentation of their beauty in his prints stimulated the concern which has saved them. The brown pelican, which is one of the most interesting of our American birds, is a constant resident of the Floridas, where it resorts to the keys and the saltwater inlets. Scarcely an hour of daylight passed without our having pelicans around us, all engaged at their ordinary occupations, some fishing or slumbering, as it were, on the bosom of the ocean. All around, for about 40 miles, seemed to be a favorite resort of these birds, and as I had excellent opportunities of observing their habits, I consider myself qualified to present you with some account of them. The flight of the brown pelican, though to appearance heavy, is remarkably well sustained, that bird being able to remain many hours at a time on wing. Their ordinary manner of proceeding either when single or in flocks, is by easy flappings and sailings, alternating at distances from 20 to 30 yards, when they glide along with great speed. Look at these birds standing on their strong legs. How dexterously do they wield that strong bill of theirs as they trim their plumage. Now they drop their wings for a while, or stretch them alternately to their full extent. They quietly draw their head over their broad shoulders, and placing their bill on their back, compose themselves to rest. But the tide is advancing. The billows chase each other toward the shores. The slumbers of the pelicans are over. The drowsy birds shake their heads, stretch open their mandibles and pouch by way of yawning, expand their ample wings, and soar away from the branches of the mangroves in search of fish. When a school is perceived, they separate at once when each plunges in an oblique and somewhat winding direction, spreading to the full stretch its lower mandible and pouch as it reaches the water. It scoops up the object of its pursuit, immersing the head and neck and sometimes the body for an instant. It immediately rises on the wing, dashes on another fish, and thus continues, sometimes plunging eight or ten times in a few minutes and always with unerring aim. The water which enters the pouch when it is immersed is immediately forced out between the partially closed mandibles. The fish, unless larger than those on which they usually feed, is instantly swallowed. The generally received idea that pelicans keep fish or water in their pouch to convey them to their young is quite erroneous. I doubt very much if a pelican could fly at all with its burden so much out of trim, as a sailor would say.
one of the most curious traits of the pelican is that it acts unwittingly as a sort of purveyor to the gulls. The laughing gull watches the motions of the pelicans, waiting for small fish to escape. Pelicans are not the only species which the gulls pirate for food. Indeed, they exploit any source they can find, here following a white ibis in the expectation of obtaining some of the crustaceans turned up. The laughing gull may be said to be a constant resident along the southern coast of the United States, and I have found it abundant over all that extent, both in winter and summer, but more especially on the shores and keys of the Floridas, where I found it breeding. Their loves are conducted with extreme pomposity. They strut and bow, throwing their heads backwards like all other gulls. Male birds feed adult females during courtship. The female mimics the begging of young gulls. The spot near the end of the beak of the adult is a signal spot. Kept by immature gulls, the adult responds by regurgitating food to feed the young. The female now pecks this spot to trigger the same parental response in the male as part of the courtship ritual. Watch again. A ring-billed gull arrives and attempts to take advantage of the food provided by the male laughing gull. The female is insistent on the attentions of the male. After further courtship feeding, the male mounts, while the female picks at his breast feathers. But the solicitations of the female are not always rewarded. All birds spend a major part of their time maintaining their feathers, cleaning, oiling, and arranging. Birds must constantly remove a multitude of parasites. Oil from a gland at the base of the tail is spread over the feathers to waterproof them, preventing soaking of the birds. Precise arrangement of the feathers must be maintained as the structural requirement of flight. Perhaps the most striking of the shorebirds are the long-legged waders, the herons, ibises, storks, and egrets. Watch carefully how these birds act. Their behavior identifies them as distinctly as the color and arrangement of their plumage and relates them to their surroundings in ways that are much more obvious. The snowy egret resorts to the borders of the saltwater marshes and feeds principally on shrimps. Many individuals which I opened there contained nothing else in their stomach. At the time when the shrimps are ascending the stream, these birds are frequently seen busily engaged in picking them up. On such occasions, their pure white color renders them conspicuous and highly pleasing to the eye. Their motions are generally quick and elegant, and while pursuing small fishes, they run swiftly through the shallows. Twenty or thirty seen at once along the margins of a marsh or a river while engaged in procuring their food form a most agreeable sight. Delicate in form, beautiful in plumage, and graceful in its movements, I never see the Louisiana heron without calling it the lady of the waters. Although the wading birds seem numerous in species and individuals, and seem to compete for the same food, they survive by fishing with different styles. The Louisiana heron uses a straightforward spearing motion to take a fish. But the heron has trespassed on the fishing territory, which a snowy egret defends as its own. The aroused egret attacks every bird which it perceives as an intruder.
and makes a spectacular aggressive display of the plumes of the head, neck, and tail. The little blue heron stirs the mud with its foot to uncover bottom living crustaceans. Wood storks are the masters of this stir feeding technique. The reddish egret mixes a complex repertory of gestures and motions which can adapt the bird to take a variety of food organisms. Unpredictable behavior in the hunter also produces confusion in the prey. An awkward immature egret pursues its haggard parent, demanding a meal. In my estimation, few of our waders are more interesting than the great blue heron. You might imagine what you see to be a statue of a bird, so motionless is it. Their contours and movements are always graceful, if not elegant. The nest of the great blue heron is large and flat, externally composed of dry sticks and matted with weeds and mosses. It is not uncommon to find the nest containing a quantity of fish and other food, some fresh and some in various stages of putrefaction. As the young advance, they are less frequently fed, although still as copiously supplied whenever opportunity offers. The quantity which they require is now so great that all the exertions of the old birds appear at times to be insufficient to satisfy their voracious appetite. And they do not provide for themselves until fully able to fly when the parents chase them off and force them to shift as they can. Although the great white heron had long been known to natives of southern Florida who shot the conspicuous bird for food, it was Audubon himself who first described the bird for science. The great white heron can be seen by its form and behavior to be a color phase of the great blue heron. It is found along the shore circling the Gulf of Mexico. Because of its small numbers, it is always endangered, and several times catastrophic storms have nearly exterminated the bird. With their longer legs, the great herons can wade into deeper waters, taking fish that the smaller waders cannot reach. Black skimmer, one of the most singularly endowed by nature, is a constant resident on all the sandy and marshy shores of our more southern states. To study its habits, the naturalist must seek the extensive sandbars, estuaries, and mouths of the rivers, and enter the sinuous bayous intersecting the broad marshes. There, during the warm sunshine of the winter days, you will see thousands of skimmers peaceably lying beside each other. If you advance nearer, the whole flock suddenly taking to wing fill the air with their harsh cries and soon reaching a considerable height, range widely around until your patience being exhausted, you abandon the place. When thus taking to wing in countless multitudes, the black of their long wings and upper parts produces a remarkable contrast to the blue sky above.
when they all veer through the air, the snowy white of their underparts gladdens your eye. Their aerial evolutions on such occasions are peculiar and pleasing, as they at times appear to be intent on removing to a great distance. Then suddenly round two and once more pass almost over you, flying so close together as to appear almost like a black cloud, first ascending and then rushing down like a torrent. While watching the movements of the black skimmer as it was searching for food, I have seen it pass its lower mandible at an angle of about 45 degrees into the water, whilst its movable upper mandible was elevated a little above the surface. In this manner, with wings raised and extended, it plowed, as it were, the element in which its quarry lay to the extent of several yards at a time. I have at times stood nearly an hour by the side of a small pond of salt water having a communication with a sea or a bay while these birds would pass within a very few yards of me, apparently quite regardless of my presence, and proceed fishing. Satisfied for the time with his study of Florida birds, Audubon took advantage of an opportunity to travel to the Dry Tortugas, remote islands in the Caribbean. Early in the afternoon of the 9th of May, I was standing on the deck of the United States Revenue Cutter, the Marion. The weather was very beautiful, although hot, and a favorable breeze wafted us onwards in our course. The captain who stood near me on looking toward the southwest ordered someone to be sent to the top to watch for the appearance of land. A young lad was instantly seen ascending the rigging, and not many minutes after he had attained his post, we heard from him the cry of land. It was the low keys of the Tortugas toward which we had been steering. No change was made in the direction of the cutter, which glided along as if aware of the knowledge possessed by her commander. Now the lighthouse lantern appeared, like a bright gem glittering in the rays of the sun. 